Hey guys, Wave Nunley with Bible Unplugged. Welcome back to another episode. Today we're going to be looking at a really unusual topic. It's the genealogy of Matthew that comes right at the beginning of the gospel. And so more often than not, we typically skip over those hard to pronounce names, big long list of names to get to the really juicy stuff, you know, like the birth of Jesus and on into the gospel ministry period. Uh, today, though, I'm going to give you at least five reasons why we shouldn't skip over, shouldn't look past this genealogy or list of Jesus' um, ancestors that comes at the very beginning of Matthew's gospel as compared to like Luke, where this genealogy doesn't show up until the end of chapter 3. So, you know, when we talk about genealogy, we usually get an idea of something like this, our family tree, or maybe something that's a little bit more technical and, and, and less inviting that kind of tracks our ancestors back to our own origins. But uh, what I want to talk about today uh, in dealing with this first 17 verses of the Gospel of Matthew has to do with uh, circles around five basic topics. Um, Matthew has an, has an introduction that's really fascinating that tracks back to language from the book of Genesis. Then he focuses on Father Abraham, the father of all the faithful, but, but more originally, the father of the nation of Israel. And so we'll talk about promise fulfillment and God's faithfulness there. Here we talk about the next one is David, and David is mentioned even more prominently than Father Abraham, and that tracks back to a message of the grace of God and also his uh, promise fulfillment and faithfulness to his promises. A fourth thing that we're going to look at is the, so, uh, an unusual set of names that shows up toward the end of the genealogy that slams all the way through the what we call the intertestamental period or what some people will refer to as the silent years where God's supposed to be inactive or disconnected and yet what we're going to see is that God never changes and has his hand on the um, people of, uh, of Israel all the way through that time between Malachi and Matthew. And then a last thing is this really strange, this kind of unusual, off-putting, um, usually misunderstood list, uh, three lists of 14 names, the way that the genealogy um, folds out in its bigger picture. And this then is going to point us to a message of God's consistency and His trustworthiness. So let's just go ahead and get into it. This business of the way that Matthew introduces Jesus' genealogy. He uses this kind of language. The book of the genealogy, or maybe ancestor list, the Hebrew would be toldot, or maybe dorot, of Jesus, Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This kind of language tracks back to ten different verses in the book of Genesis that use exactly this same kind of introduction to a list of ancestor names. Why would Matthew do that? Why would he start his gospel? Check this out, chapter 1, verse 1. Why would he start out his gospel with a phrase that hearkens the ears of the listener back to the book of Genesis? Well, because Matthew's gospel is divided up, big picture, into five major sections or categories, which correspond to the five books of Torah, or the Law of Moses. And here in book one, we're getting this immediate connection with the book of Genesis, or origins, first things. Uh, not surprisingly, at the very end of Matthew's Gospel, in book 5 of Matthew's Gospel, we get the report of Jesus' death and His burial in the same way that in book 5 of the Torah, what we call the book of Deuteronomy, or in Hebrew, Devarim, we get the death and burial of Moses. So Matthew is presenting Jesus as this second Moses, this a prophet like me to whom you shall listen that Moses uh, predicts. It's a beautiful intro to a major theme in the Gospel of Matthew that tracks all the way through the entire Gospel where Jesus is being compared to Moses and uh, connected to Moses. Also, by the way, a beautiful example of 
consistency, the consistency of God's revelation, the interconnectedness as opposed to discontinuity. The Bible is a whole, and the, the, the Bible belongs to be understood together, not in uh, jerky bits and pieces, disconnected um, uh, inconsistency, but rather this continuity and consistency of the, um, uh, of the revealed Word of God. So a beautiful start here. Uh, we've not even gotten into the content of the genealogy, but just in this, uh, the beauty of the language of this introduction to it. Now let's talk about the next theme that shows up in these first 17 verses or the genealogy of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Abraham and promise fulfillment. So we get in Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then at the end, this last verse of the genealogy, therefore all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. So at the beginning and end, in other words, bookends, uh, or what we call a, um, a sort of an inclusio, uh, we get Abraham mentioned at the beginning and Abraham mentioned at the end. This tells us, again, that this revelation that is taking place in the person of Jesus, of God Emmanuel, Emmanuel in the flesh, coming, becoming, um, uh, taking on human flesh, is closely connected to this revelation of God in the Hebrew Bible or what is called sometimes the Old Testament. So uh, Abraham, father of the faithful, um, and uh, the, um, the wellspring, sort of the, found, the foundation of what God is doing in this chosen people business. And God makes specific promises to Abraham. He promises that, he, that he's going to make Abraham a great nation and in, and, uh, or a numerous people and that in him all the families of the earth will be blessed. And this is partly in part fulfilled, a, a major leap forward in redemptive history when the good news of forgiveness and reconciliation with God through the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus is it, it, that message is taken to the entire world and the blessing then, the promise of Abraham is fulfilled or is m more fulfilled in this um, earthly ministry uh, of Jesus in reconciling us to God and uh, granting us forgiveness and full status with God. Now next, the promise of David, the prominence of David in the, uh, in the genealogy of Matthew that then gives to us a message of God's grace uh, extended to humanity and also another example of God's faithfulness to fulfill His promises. So let's take a look at three different verses in the Gospel of Matthew. The, the first verse of, of the chapter, um, the middle of the chapter, and then the end of the chapter. The, in other words, bathed with the importance of the person of King David. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, first mentioned, son of Abraham, and Jesse was born to, da uh, and to Jesse was born David the king, second mention, and to David was born Solomon, third mention. Therefore, all the generations from Abraham we get at the end are, uh, to, from Abraham to David are 14 generations. So David mentioned very prominently at the end, one, two, three, for five times in the, uh, this genealogy of Matthew that David has such an incredible prominence because it is from him. Abra with Abraham, Jesus is seen as this, this um, ideal Israelite and a representative of true Israel, of the true fulfillment of the promise to be a blessing to Abraham and through Abraham to the world. That's, that's Jesus as son of Abraham, but now more specifically, Jesus is son of David. He is not simply an uh, Israelite, an average, you know, dime a dozen garden variety Israelite uh, descendant of Abraham, but he is royalty uh, and he is a fulfillment also of God's promise to David. Um, uh, and, and grace in the direction of David. Here's an example of that. 
to Boaz and to Ruth, by the way. I'm adding this in because it's a part of the context. To Boaz and Ruth was born Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse uh, was born David. So we've got one generation, two generations, three uh, generations, and David, the fourth generation. Well, so what? David is a fourth generation when you count um, uh, Ruth and Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and then David. Well, it's because in the Torah, we are taught that by Moses, no Ammonite or Moabite, and Ruth was a Moabite, shall enter into the assembly of Yahweh. None of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, will ever enter the assembly of the Lord. Well, David not only enters the assembly of, of the Lord, he becomes the ruler of the assembly of the Lord. So, um, whereas this is the requirement and the expectation, God's grace grafts David in in the fourth generation. He doesn't have to wait till after the tenth generation. And this is simply an extension of the, an example of the grace of God to an individual that, who is then elevated to a position of prominence, eminence, and even royalty ruling over uh, God's people. So an example, a great example of, in the Hebrew Bible, the grace of God. Not that different from the prophet Samuel, who was born to uh, an Ephraimite, uh, uh, mother and father, and yet eventually gets grafted into the tribe of Levi and ultimately becomes, as an Ephraimite, a, the high priest, which is only uh, to, uh, given to a descendant of Levi and specifically a descendant of Aaron, the priest. Uh, all kinds of examples like this of the grace of God extended to individuals in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. And then with respect to uh, Jesus' um, full genealogy, we hear at least three very irregular situations that to Judah, the patriarch, one of the twelve uh, sons of, Joseph, of Jacob, uh, Jacob um, he has uh, by Tamar, who is his um, widowed uh, daughter-in-law, uh, he ends up having uh, Peretz and Zerah. Um, so, a, unusual situation there, unusual situation with a, um, a Moabitess being grafted into the people of Israel in the first generation, uh, married to Boaz uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, that's an unusual situation. And then, uh, in the middle of the, gosp of the um, Gospel of Matthew's genealogy, to David was born Solomon by her, she, who had been the wife of Uriah. And I've done the math for us there. That's Bathsheba, and we all know the story of David and Bathsheba. So some pretty in, in interesting irregularities, uh, specifically connected to women, by the way, in the, um, in the genealogy of Matthew. And yet God works through all of those interesting highways and byways and brings grace and mercy in each one of these situations and brings forth His Messiah or Mashiach through uh, and despite or however, whatever word you want to use, these um, unusual situations that bring forth birth and move God's plan along. God is bigger and God is greater. He's, uh, he can overrule even our missteps, sins, um, and irregularities. This is a beautiful picture of the way that God condescends to uh, human imperfection and continues to work His uh, plan through us. Uh, and that's true in our personal lives uh, today as well. Here's an example of the, uh, the faithfulness of God to His promises. We have this in Psalm 132. Yahweh swore to David that his sons would sit on his um, throne and also their sons will sit upon the throne. And look at this last word, forever. We get this promise going all the way back to the book of 2 Samuel in the Hebrew Bible. God saw fit to preserve this seed of David. And according to both genealogies, Matthew's and Luke's, Jesus is a full descendant of David. We get this in the writings of Paul as well. This has to be seen as a 
as promise fulfillment. God being faithful to His promises, keeping them to the nines, and bringing forth His Messiah through the line of David, that is the, who, who is then elevated to the throne, and that throne is forever. His kingdom is forever. Beautiful example throughout history of God having His hand on humanity and specifically on a people group, the Israelites, and on a tribe, Judah, and then on a specific clan of Judah, the clan of Jesse. Uh, absolutely, absolutely incredible that God would be that faithful. When He gives us a promise, He does not let those words fall to the ground. And this is a great encouragement of, of, for our faith to keep trusting in God, keep trusting in His promises, because He is true to those promises. Now let's take a look at this uh, list of intertestamental names. Ten names embedded in this genealogy of Jesus, recorded by Matthew in chapter 1, Ten intertestamental genera generations. You can't find these guys in the Hebrew Bible. Why is that? Because it ended with Malachi. It ended with Zerubbabel. And after that, we're on our own because these guys aren't attested in the Bible, Hebrew Bible because it was finished. It was over. And yet, and yet. So let's look at the immutability of God as expressed in these names. And I just, uh, uh, lots of stuff on this slide. I apologize for its busyness, but I wanted you to get the full impact of the reality of the fact that God is still at work in what we call the intertestamental period or the silent years. I like to refer to them as the not so silent years. So here we go with Matthew chapter 1. Verses, six, verses 13 through 16. You look at this in your own Bible. Please do a study of this and look and see if you can find these guys in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. I'm, I can promise you you won't, but it'll be a fun uh, uh, job hunting and pecking and looking for that. So, to Zerubbabel, we're now at the end of the, old, the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. This is after the return from Babylonian exile. So one of these guys who brings that nation, that, the nation back from Babylon to the land of Israel. We're talking 538 B.C., something like that. And he had a child whose name is Aviud. And then Aviud had Eliakim. And Eliakim had Azor. We're up to three generations now. And then Azor had Zadok, Zadok um, or Zadok. And, and Zadok had Achim. Um, we're now into one, two, three, four, five generations. Eliud is the uh, son of Achim. Then Elazar, then Matan, then Yaakov, and then Yosef. You put them all together and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten generations. Ten full generations. And God did not let go His hand from the people of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, from the clan of Jesse, until He had guided and directed the descendants of that clan or that, that part of the tribe ten generations down to Joseph who would become the adoptive father of Jesus. This is amazing because what we're getting is intertestamental revelation. Now, from a genealogy that was evidently kept within Joseph's family, it has been embedded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. All of this is a la carte. It is off the menu. Uh, it, it cannot be found in the Hebrew Bible. What does this then tell us of the nature of God? It tells us, number one, He keeps His promises. Even beyond the end of the, the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, God is still active and at work, protecting, preserving, directing history, directing the history of a specific group of people. And that is true to you today. You know, your, your name's probably not in the Bible. I can guarantee you my name, Wave, is not. Uh, in the Bible of any individual or whatever, and yet I have a history with God, and God has history with me. He's got His hand on my life, He has His hand on your life, and He is guiding and directing us 
in the same way, in no way different than he has been directing human history from creation and that's going to extend all the way to the consummation of human history. He has you in the palm of his hand. He has a plan for you to walk out. You are a specific puzzle piece in this big picture play drama of life and he has work for you to do. He's got promises to fulfill with you. He's got a relationship he's pursuing with you. So you are fully integrated just like these guys who didn't show up in the Hebrew Bible and yet God had a plan for them to through them bring forth his Messiah. That is a pretty cool deal and it tells us that God is always, God is always engaged in human history. He never took a break of four or five hundred years off. He was never silent. He was still speaking to his, still guiding, still directing, protecting, providing for his people and he's still doing it today. God has never been off the job. He's always been on the job. This is indicated all the way through the Bible. I'm just going to throw up a couple of passages to anchor this in biblical reality that this God of the Hebrew Bible didn't just, you know, suddenly and, and radically change between the Testaments. He didn't do that. He doesn't just suddenly and radically change the way that He interacts with human beings after the New Testament is completed either. Look at these passages, one from Isaiah. Even unto your old age, I will be the same. We're changing, we're aging. God is immutable or changeless. Malachi 3 6, end of the Hebrew Bible. For I, Yahweh, do not change. Does that sound pretty specific and pretty clear enough? It does to me. God is over and over declaring His immutability, the fact that He does not change in His basic nature. He works with us through covenant. He works through us consistently. He works whether it's recorded in the Bible or it's a la carte and not in the Bible. God is the same. Well, here's the same message in the New Testament. We saw Hebrew Bible. Now let's look at James chapter 1. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, coming from God. Good gifts come from God with whom there is no variation or change due to turning. Same message as we get in the Hebrew Bible, right? And then we have this one that almost everybody knows by heart, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So locked in, whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Malachi, it's the psalmist that we didn't look at, James, Hebrews, Old Testament, New Testament, the message is the same. God does not change. Culture does. Laws, human laws, human generated laws change from time to time. Hairstyles and, and, and coat styles, shoe styles, everything is in constant flux. But God doesn't change. Consequently, His Word doesn't change either as an outgrowth as of His nature. These are the goalposts that stay in the same place. This is a target that doesn't move. There's a lot of, of security in that, God. Guys, uh, listen. When we end up in the emergency room or when we're faced with an insurmountable bill that we know that we can't pay, is it not good to know that we can connect to, through prayer, a God who is no different today and doesn't treat us any differently today than He did Adam or, or, or Abraham or David or, or Ezra Nehemiah or Jesus or Paul or whoever. God stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even to our old age, He will remain constant and consistent. He is immutable. He does not change. Then we've got this really interesting um, list, three lists of 14 generations. So kind of the organizing principle uh, around which Ma Matthew constructs this beautiful genealogy of 17 verses. Let's take a look. At the very end of the genealogy that Matthew provides for us in verse 17, verse 17. Therefore, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14. From Abraham to David, 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. Then from the deportation to Babylon to the time of Christ, again, 
14 generations. Is this arbitrary? Where is Matthew getting this organizing principle of 14 generations? I think that it is from the name David. I've put it up here in Hebrew and then I put, put it there in blue too because of you know, the nearness of Hanukkah and you know, blue is connected to the Israeli flag and to the, uh, the Jewish talit. So you know, I thought it was kind of neat to you know, put up a little blue David. But I put the Hebrew there as well. And with Hebrew letters, long before, hundreds of years before Arabic numerals came into vogue in the Middle East and began to be used to reflect um, the number of or account, uh, letters of the alphabet were being used. Dalit is the fourth letter of the alphabet. So you can count four for that, both on the beginning and on the end of David's name. Um, so there's eight right there. Then the middle letter is a vav, which is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And if you add eight plus six, you end up with four, uh, 14. So four, six is 10, another four is 14. I think that that's probably where Matthew is deriving his um, orientation, his organizing principle of 14 generations from Abraham to David, and then from David to uh, the deportation to Babylon, and then from the deportation to the birth of Jesus, another 14 generations. What this, saying, what this is saying to us is that God is consistent and that there is a cadence that He has built into time and human history. Uh, uh, there's another even more important point though. God is consistent. There is a cadence to human history, but what, what Matthew is arguing to his Jewish audience that he is desperately trying to reach with this message of Jesus uh, uh, being Messiah and being the source, the, 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 the uh, point of access to God through forgiveness of sin uh, in his death is, is simply this, that if it was time from the time of Abraham to David for God to raise up a deliverer, 14 different generations. And then there was time for, from David to the deportation to Babylon, another time of need for deliverance of his people back to the land, back to the covenant, back to the glory, back to the restoration of promise and the presence of God. Then there's also 14 more generations to the time where the, the next deliverer, the great deliverer, the Messiah of God would be uh, revealed. This is simply saying that in Jesus' day, it was time for the coming of the Messianic King. Uh, the cadence, the ebb and flow of human history indicated that it was time for God to make the next major move in His plan to redeem a people to Himself. So the, the, the a plea, the argument is that did you miss this? Did time slip by? Uh, did some, uh, some way you, you slept through this most important event, the crowning event of God's redemptive history, that the, it was time for God to move yet again, and this time in, in, in a sort of a, an apex, the, 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 the top of the pile of God's interventions in human history. Did you miss that? Do you need to go back and recalibrate, reconsider, uh, this person of Jesus and his identity and place in God's plan in human history. Big time appeal. Go back and rethink this. It was time for God to move. Did you miss it? Uh, and if you did not miss it, then hang on to that because this is indeed the, um, the greatest chapter in God's history of redeeming a people uh, to himself. And Paul says as, as much. Paul says the same thing in Galatians when he says, but when the fullness of, the, uh, of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Paul saying exactly the same thing that we get in Matthew 1.17. It was time. The time was ripe. It was full. It was time for God to move in this um, sending of the messianic figure and for the dawning of the messianic age. Uh, it was indeed 
uh, just exactly the right time. You know, He's a God of perfect timing. He is in our lives as well today. Uh, he, it, it's not late. It isn't early. It's always right on time. I hope that you've found that in your relationship and walk with God. Um, and if you haven't, you're going to find it in the future. Um, for those who have experienced it, you will experience it again. God is a God of perfect timing. Perfect timing brought Israel out of Egypt. Perfect time, timing split the Red Sea. Perfect timing split the Jordan River. Perfect timing for manna and quail and for God's provision in their lives and in ours as well. Perfect timing. God is a God of perfect timing. Um, be encouraged in that. If, if you feel like His promise is delayed, nope, it, it's always right on time. Um, this is simply the case. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, all of the promises of God in Him are yes. And, by the way, I put this up in, and, and I've formatted it in poetic parallelism, parallelism because I wanted you to see that not only does Jesus play this Hebrew poetic parallelism game, but Paul does it too. Biblical authors simply do this. So we've got this ellipsis. All the promises of God in Him are yes, and, and you have to read this in, all the promises of God in Him are amen to the glory of God. God's promises are sure. God's promises are true. They were true when He uttered them, true when He fulfilled them to these saints in the Hebrew Bible, saints in the New Testament, um, and they're true with saints that He fulfills His promises in today as well. Uh, I hope that you found this enlightening because as compared to skipping over the, the genealogy of Matthew, when we take a moment, we reflect, we research, we find that there are some incredible messages in this genealogy of Matthew. Incredibly encouraging messages. Messages also that remind us that God is a promise-keeping God. That God is a God of consistency. That God doesn't change. There's all kinds of really cool messaging going on in this simple list of names in the first 17 verses of the first gospel. I trust that God's met you. I trust that God's encouraged and strengthened you in your walk with Him and challenged you to continue to walk after truth and reality as revealed by context. God richly bless you in this uh, wonderful season of the year and uh, we will see you next time in our next episode of Bible Unplugged. Until then, God richly bless.